Okay, so where we left off on Thursday was uh, on Western blotting, uh, also known as immunoblotting. And again, uh, this is uh, just as a reminder, um, the prior lecture and this lecture is really uh, mostly focused on methodologies. Um, these are things that you guys will see in Ideas Lab, uh, and so um, take, it, uh, take it seriously, and, and certainly uh, we should have an active conversation uh, today about, about this material, because uh, you will be expected to perform these analytical methods. All right, so we sort of ran through this super quickly, and this isn't a really uber stressful lecture, meaning I'm not going to cram a ton of information. We're really going to talk about two methods today. One is the immunoblot, and the other is ELISA. And then we'll sort of round this up by a discussion of the, the anthrax and, and pregnancy testing. Uh, so feel free to ask as many questions you would like. I think we have more than enough time. All right, so if you remember, uh, hopefully you guys remember uh, about what an SDS page is. Uh, anyone care to remind us? Yeah. Safety data sheet, no. <laughs> That's the MSDS. <laughs> SDS page. It's a good guess there. <laughs> you need an MSDS if you're going to run an SDS page because acrylamide is, uh, is toxic, right? Sodium dodecyl sulfate, which is the surfactant, right, that we're going to use to denature a protein. Page polyacrylamide, it's the, the gel that we're going to run it in, gel electrophoresis, right? Electrophoresis, we're going to run a charge from negative to positive across the polymer polyacrylamide. We're going to unfold proteins with SDS, and we're going to rely on that large negative charge that SDS has to help migrate those proteins, right? Proteins are going to migrate or run, electrophoretically run through the gel, and they'll be separated uh, based predominantly on, on size. Uh, and we accentuate that by using uh, SDS. Okay, so what we've done then is we've run this gel. Remember, this is a cartoon only, so your proteins are colorless at this point in time. Uh, vendors will often give us molecular weight markers that we talk about, uh, I guess, on Thursday. Uh, and a lot of times they'll pre-color those, right? So they'll conjugate colors to those proteins. So when you're running the gel, you kind of begin to know where things are running. So you can either crank it up to speed it up, or you can stop it completely if you get separation of the molecular weight markers uh, that are indicative of the protein that you're interested in studying. Uh, you can you can actually stop it short. All right, so we've run, we've uh, you know, uh, run these proteins on this gel. Uh, our next goal is uh, to transfer this onto what we call a blot or some type of membrane. And does anyone remember the reason, the rationale for doing this that I gave you guys on Thursday as we were rushing out of the class? Well, it's a quiet day, I can tell. All right. So remember that we're going to form this polyacrylamide gel, and we're going to polymerize it with that crosslinker bisacrylamide, so it has a really fine mesh, right? Antibodies are very large, about 150 kilodaltons. So the ability of a very large protein to actually penetrate by diffusion alone into that gel, right, is very, very limited. And so it would take... I can't even fathom how long it would take. We will say days. <laughs> That's probably on the order uh, of, of how long it would take to get that antibody to diffuse all the way into the target that you'd want. And then we have to wash away all the unbound antibody, right? So it would take another series of days and extensive washing to get that antibody that's not bound to the specific target that you're, that you're after in order to get out of that gel. So we're going to simplify that process. So I don't know if you can tell, here on this cartoon, there's a darker gray, fine sort of square or rectangle behind that. That is our, our blot or our membrane. Uh, there are a number of different forms. Uh, we can use, uh, back in the old days, we used to use nitrocellulose, uh, which is just a charged polymer. 
uh, and it would uh, result in electrostatic binding uh, of your proteins onto the membrane. We now use polyvinyl difluoride, which is a, a synthetic polymer uh, that has a very high binding affinity, non-specific, but binding affinity to, to charge proteins. Uh, we're going to activate it, uh, and we're going to handle it very, very carefully, usually with gloves. Uh, and the reason is that because it binds proteins, if I grab the membrane with my finger, all the proteins on my finger will also. So you'll wind up with a really pretty fingerprint on the nitrocellulose membrane. All right, so we'll activate it. We'll slap it right up against the gel. And remember, we're running a charge from negative to positive in order to separate the proteins this way. When we slap that membrane on, we've got to electrophorese the proteins against right, the membrane. So they'll move out of the gel and onto the membrane. And so we're going to switch the charge. So now the charge is going across the short axis, right? The thin, uh, the thin uh, dimension of the gel. So in this case of this picture, we're going to try to drive them electrophoretically into the board and up against that membrane. So we just switch the electrodes around, okay? Any questions on that? So at, to this point in time, yeah, go ahead. Correct, correct. That's exactly right. So we're going to electrophoretically um, separate these proteins in the vertical axis first. What you wind up doing in practice is that you're going to cast these gels in these glass plates that have spacers that are a defined thickness, right? Uh, and you cast them in this very regular way. And then when I'm ready to transfer them onto a membrane, I'm going to pull the top glass plate off, right? So I've got a gel and it's sort of sandwiched in between uh, basically a mold. So the back, the back glass plate has these two molds and they're basically, this is a, this is a, a bad dimensional drawing. <laughs> a very bad dimensional drawing. And so these have a certain level of thickness to them, right? So you can think about it looking like that, okay? And so your gel is in this zone here, okay? And this is glass, right? So I'm literally going to pull that polymer all the way out, right? Now you can imagine when you're doing this in practice, you better know what the orientation is. Because the minute I pull it out, right, um, I have to know what this corner is, that corner is, that corner is, that corner is. Because if I invert it, and then I transfer it, and then I do this western block, my interpretation is going to be completely wrong because I've inverted the gel, right? So a lot of us will do cute little tricks, like I'll take a razor blade and literally just cut off that whole section right there, right? So I always know the top left corner of my gel because it's, I got a little triangle that's cut out of it. So there's some little tricks that you can use. If you have the pre-marked um, molecular weight markers, and that obviously helps. A lot of times we'll do uh, silly tricks like I'll do a molecular weight marker down the left side, but if I have a really complicated scenario, then I'll do like two on the right, right? And that way I always have some kind of designation uh, of what's left and, and what's right. Um, there, there are all sorts of different things you can do. All right. So we've transferred this. So we've, again, as you mentioned, we've, we've electrophoresed the proteins now into the board, and it's a completely different apparatus, right? So the gel will run vertically in general, and then a lot of times the blotting, sometimes they're vertical blots, sometimes they're horizontal blots, but the difference is the apparatus that you're using is driving the charge right up against, you know, into the membrane. Now, the charges are always set for these cassettes that you use. So obviously then another trick for you guys or something to pay attention to is make sure your membrane is on the right size as well, right side of that gel as well. Because you can electrophoresis your proteins off the other end, and now you've lost you've lost all that work. Okay? So paying attention to where the charge is, and remember we're always trying to electrophoresis the, the proteins towards the positive electrode.
So that's, that's an example. All right, so I told you that the membranes are um, kind of optimized for protein binding. Uh, so the next step we'll want to do uh, is block all the unoccupied sites, right? All right, so we're going to transfer onto that membrane. We'll just get rid of the gel at that point in time. Um, there's some pretty slick devices that, because you oftentimes load so much protein on your gels, you can actually uh, transfer those protein signatures onto multiple membranes. And there's some devices that allow you to transfer one single gel, and the protein's contained in that, uh, that page gel, uh, onto up to 10 membranes that you sandwich back to back to back. And now you get basically 10 identical samples. So they're not quite identical, but they're pretty close. All right. So because it's going to bind up all other protein, if I dump my primary antibody, right, the antibody that's going to be used to detect the specific protein that I'm interested in, it's going to go everywhere, right? And it's going to be stuck to my membrane. So the first thing I'm going to do is block it. Again, the block is not really brown. Uh, so it's just for demonstrative purposes. We're going to block that, the rest of that membrane, okay? And we're going to block it with proteins that... Uh, can anyone make a guess about what properties I might want the proteins that I'm going to use to block the membrane? What properties might you want those, those types of proteins to have? What would be one absolutely detrimental thing if that protein displayed one behavior above all else that might really wreck your acid? Anybody? What if my protein, what if the protein I'm using to block has specific affinity for my target protein? Well, then it might actually shield the ability of my antibody to bind to my target protein, right? That would be bad. The other is I certainly don't want it to have just general protein binding ability, right? If it's, if it's a protein that's kind of known to be sticky or a promiscuous binder of other proteins for whatever reason, then I might have a lot of background with my primary antibody, right? It might just non-specifically stick to my blocking protein. So oftentimes we'll use a number of characteristic proteins. Uh, heat denatured BSA is one. So bovine serum albumin. Uh, it's in your bloodstream. It helps keep your osmotic balance uh, correct. It also helps coat surfaces, uh, like injury surfaces, uh, and prevents other proteins from sticking. So it just has a real, a lot of nice, uh, nice properties that that um, prevent other proteins from binding to it. Um, and uh, and so you'll find that we we block with BSA a lot. Uh, we will also block with casein, so milk protein. Milk protein has a lot of nice. Um, Effects. So we'll actually get, uh, back in the day, I think we still do this, uh, we'll get 2% um, milk in the powder form and make up milk in the lab. Um, doesn't have to be drinkable. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we'll block our membranes with that. Uh, there are others that get way more elegant and extravagant. Uh, I've blocked um, Western blots in the past with things like fish gelatin. Uh, it has really interesting properties that, again, make it a good blocking agent in certain conditions. A lot of times it's trial and error, though, right? Uh, a lot of this is where science meets art to a certain degree, uh, and you have to problem solve. Antibodies might have, I mean, they're their own beast, right? They're their own protein, and they may have certain characteristics that make them stickier than other antibodies. Uh, your target protein might have specific attributes. Uh, one in particular is that you shouldn't, uh, and again, some of the antibodies are probably better nowadays, but there was a general rule that if you were uh, immunoblotting for a phosphorylated protein, meaning your antibody bound the phosphorylated state of protein X, that you would never want to block in milk because it prevented or diminished the ability of those types of antibodies to bind phosphorylated structures. Um, so there's some tricks. You can always Google it and then find out like trouble, uh, troubleshooting for, for your specific antibody. All right, so we're going to use now an antibody against our protein of interest. And remember, this was motivated by the fact that when we talked about SDS page, 
or 2D electrophoresis, right, was that we got all these spots, but I couldn't tell you what spot was what protein. So the use of an antibody in Western blotting allows us to pinpoint and identify which band is our protein of interest. Okay? So we're going to do that. Then you're going to wash, wash, wash. Uh, step number five is we're going to add a labeled antibody against the first antibody. This is what we call our secondary antibody. And we're going to talk a little bit about why you want to use a secondary antibody. And finally, I'm going to, well, this is, Depends on what's on your secondary antibody. If your secondary antibody is labeled with a fluorescent tag, I can take it right to an imager, right? After I wash the secondary antibody that's non-specifically bound, I get rid of that. And I can actually directly image that gel on a fluorescent imager, okay? Like an Odyssey or something like that that we have in MBME. If my secondary antibody has an enzyme that's covalently bound to it in order to, for detection. So uh, there are a number of horseradish peroxidase is one where it's an enzyme that's going to catalyze a reaction and we're going to use that reaction to evolve some type of colorimetric uh, imaging, right? Um, so um, there are luciferase proteins that require light emission. So depending on uh, the detection mechanism that's attached to your secondary you might have additional steps, like you might have to actually treat the antibody with something in order to evolve uh, a color. Ultimately, we want to image it. Okay, so there's our primary, right? It goes on. Now, that one step was us incubating that primary antibody on and wash, 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 right? Because these guys will want to stick everywhere. In this case, the secondary antibody is fluorescently tagged in fuchsia. Again, you incubate it, you want it to directly bind to that primary antibody, and then you're going to try and wash. You're going to try and wash as much away, right, because anything that's left that's not this specific interaction that we see here is just background, right? Secondaries can be notoriously messy. All right, so what you actually get in the end is a white membrane with some form of band, right, that's being detected by an imager. All right, so what do they look like? This is it. Uh, this is two identical blots. One on the left is a standard SDS page stained with Kumasi blue. Remember the blue gene dye we talked about? And on the right is a Western blot. And a couple of things you'll notice. A, the molecular weight markers disappear in your Western blot. Something to be aware of. <laughs> um, number two is that you can see here in like lanes one and lanes three where what they're doing here in this particular experiment is they have um, a bacteria that they have introduced a foreign, uh, foreign gene into. This is a, a plasmid DNA, and they're trying to get this bacterium to express a protein of interest. Uh, in the lanes one and two, they're trying to get this bacterium to express uh, this protein thyroidoxin. And in lanes three and four, they're trying to get this bacterium to produce uh, ATPase, okay? And so you get this big, nasty band. Uh, the differences between band one and band two is that uh, they, the band on the band number one, excuse me, lane number one is a whole cell lysate. So that's all the bacterial proteins plus their protein of interest. And here, I don't know, I do a lot of biotechnology in the lab. That's excellent, right? If I see that, I'm like, ooh, man, it's really making it. Um, normally what you see is something closer to lane three where the expression of ATPase kind of is getting lost in the background of, of all the bacterial proteins. Because remember, all I've done is mash up that bacterial pellet, and now I'm running it down on my gel. Okay? So in lanes two, what they've done is, and I don't know the, the specifics for this protein, um, they've done some type of either affinity uh, chromatography, some type of purification protocol on this to try to isolate their protein of interest from all the other garbage that this bacterium is making. Okay? And so what you see then is what I really need to do, perhaps not in the case of lanes one and two in the, in the expression of thyrodoxin, but certainly in this case of, of lanes three and four, is run a Western blot to ensure that this protein I got out of this complete mess is my protein of interest. A couple of things that we'll use, right, are 
is the size right, right? Do I see a band that's the right size, the predicted size of that protein? So that's one little bit of information. I might say, okay, this is really promising. Now we'll do a Western blot and, and we'll confirm. All right. So this is what the Western looks like. Uh, anyone want to fathom a guess um, about in lane one what this little guy is up here? So we've got this band that's, if these are lined up, which they look like they are, somewhere around 50 kilodaltons. Anyone want to fathom a guess what that is? There. What was yesterday? Was it a holiday? Yeah, what? GTPAs? Oh, you mean uh, instead of ATPAs? It could be. Um, that's one good guess. Why would GTPAs come out when I'm doing a Western blot for, well, I guess theoretically, right, this Western blot is for both ATPAs and thyroidoxin, right? So presumably if, if they're not showing me that this is two separate gels, I have to assume it's one which means they added their primaries at the same time, and they might have added their secondaries at the same time. So, yeah, sure, it could have been, it could be uh, some, something that cross-reacts, right, with the antibody for ATPase. So maybe it's the bacterial form of ATPase, right? And for whatever reason, I don't really see it here. So that's maybe not, yeah, maybe not. It, but maybe a GTPase that has enough structural similarities to an ATPase, although that's a lot of different proteins, right? Uh, GTPase is an ATPase. Any other guesses? But that's a good one, right? So when you try to mix two primaries to evolve two different proteins on the same gel, the idea of cross-reactivity is something you have to consider. Anything else? What a fundamental assumption, I know these are wide open-ended questions, what fundamental assumption are you making about these antibodies and their ability to detect the protein of choice? What was that? Yeah. They won't bind to any other proteins as well. Yeah, they won't bind to any other proteins as well, right? But they're specific, right? So specific, you're assuming a high level of specificity of these antibodies for the target of interest and nothing else, right? And you can see that when I've got a lot of garbage in my lane, right, here a bunch of ba other bacterial proteins, right, you're really challenging that assumption that your antibody is really only going to bind the protein of interest. I mean, I guess a couple of other hypotheses it's that, that I might make. One other one, I guess it's maybe... Um, could be could be plausible is it's it's hard to tell like what the molecular weight is here because this is my lowest marker is 26 so I have a hard time resolving what the molecular weight of thyroidoxin is but it could be a some form of weird multimer right the protein of interest right if it dimerizes then we might actually see that as a a, a larger band right okay all right, so let's talk a little bit about antibodies and how they work and what makes them, <laughs> what makes them work a little bit. So uh, in particular, in the case of a Western blot, we're going to use antibodies. We're, we'll talk about where antibodies come from and the biology of how they come to be uh, in the next couple of lectures. Uh, but for now, we're going to talk about them uh, with respect to them as a tool, okay? So antibodies, you can think of these as receptors against foreign material. That foreign material being an antigen. You think about the fact that we generate antibodies against viruses, against bacterial proteins, and these are antibodies against normally uh, proteins, can be against RNA or DNA, although it's a little bit more rare, okay? Uh, but these are antibodies, uh, antibodies are receptors that your body is going to generate in order to recognize foreign from self. Okay. In diseases, uh, autoimmune diseases like lupus, we start generating antibodies against proteins in our own body for a lot of bad reasons, right? That evolves. 
Okay. When we consider these receptors, right, in Western blots, uh, we've defined a primary antibody. The primary antibody is the antibody that's detecting our protein of interest, presumably in a specific fashion, right? Meaning it binds no other protein and only ours of interest. Okay. All right. The secondary antibody is an antibody that's going to recognize and bind to all primary antibodies of a given species. Okay. And we'll, we have an example. All right. So the example of this is that I'm trying to detect protein kinase A and the catalytic subunit of protein kinase A. In this case, I'm going to use a rabbit so that um, the way we designate this, this is it would be rabbit anti-mouse, rabbit anti-human, rabbit anti-goat, right? So rabbit, in this case, uh, tells me what animal the antibody was raised in. Say raised in, meaning that animal, a rabbit in this case, was immunized against protein kinase A and the catalytic subunit of protein kinase A. Okay? Now, if that was the human form of protein kinase A, the catalytic subunit of protein kinase A, I would say rabbit anti human PKAC. Does that make sense? If I had created the donkey protein kinase A catalytic subunit and immunized with that, I would call this rabbit anti-donkey protein kinase A. Okay? Anyone have any questions about that? I see questions emerging. No one wants to ask. Yeah. No, and so we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I'm just getting confused with the secondary antibody bond to the constant, but it isn't like an antigen binding to the primary. It's going to bind to the constant, the FC domain of the of the primary, and so I'll get to that here in just a second. So, so you can have um, mouse anti PKAC. I can have donkey anti-PKAC, right? So I can have this, an antibody that recognizes this specific protein raised in almost any animal, okay? And so we're going to talk a little bit about how we generate these antibodies here in a second from a practical perspective. All right, so in that case, if that's the primary antibody, then our secondary antibody is going to be some type of enzyme conjugated antibody that targets another antibody, okay? And there's a number of reasons that, that we'll do this. In this case, right, this one is a goat anti-rabbit IgG, right? So presumably this rabbit anti-PKAC is a, the specific isotype of, of antibody known as IgG, and so I'm going to raise a whole secondary set of secondary antibodies against that primary. Okay. The nice thing, well, I guess we'll talk about it here in a minute. So why use secondaries? Okay. So as alluded to, the secondary antibody is going to be directed to the constant domain or the FC domain of the primary antibody. And it's going to be regardless of the specificity of its antigen binding domains, right? The fab fragments. So the fab part of IgG is what helps me detect my microphone from my computer from my desk here, right? But the secondary antibody is going to be binding the parts of me that uh, are shared between an antibody that binds microphone and an antibody that binds computer. Does that make sense? So you can find a problem, right? If I have, let's say I have, I want to do this experiment where I'm both detecting thyrodoxin and ATPase, and I have two antibodies, and one is raised in a rabbit, and the second one is raised in a rabbit. I can't actually do that experiment, right? 
Well, I guess in the Western blood you could. In Elijah, you won't be able to. The reason is that my secondary antibody will detect both, both of those antibodies. You can use that to your advantage, but it also just realize that you can't, it limits you as far as your interpretation of certain kinds of data because you can't say definitively that your secondary antibody is binding one primary versus the other. Does that make sense? Maybe. All right. Okay. So, secondary antibodies. So, why use secondary antibodies? Case number one, I can mass produce these. Right? I can make copious amounts of rabbit anti-mouse IgG. Right? Because I'm not making it to a very specific target. I'm making it to a very you know, broader target. Right? So this FC domain. And I can just make as much... I can generate as many rabbits in that case that will generate that antibody as I possibly can, okay? Because I know that I'll be able to use them in a multitude of, of cases. All right, now, point number two, the secondary can be wastefully coupled to a chromogenic enzyme or a fluorophore, okay? So making primary antibodies is insanely expensive, and we're gonna talk about that. Depends on what quality of antibody you want to make, but they can get. Uh, last year alone, I spent thirty-five thousand dollars on one antibody, and I made about ten micrograms of it. So I, not enough to do much with. Okay, so they can, depending on the antibody itself, can be really, really expensive. So if I have this thing that costs that much for an amount you can't even see in a tube, right? It's that little. Then I certainly don't want to waste it trying to label it with, an in, with inefficient chemistry, okay? So a lot of times, detecting, uh, so labeling a protein with a fluorophore, right, is it's not a 100% reaction, right? You're gonna, we're gonna leverage stoichiometry and the chemistry of a reaction to try to optimize the yield, but the reality is that I'm always gonna wind up in that case with antibody that some of it has label on it and some of it doesn't. The antibody, if I use all my primary to do uh, a functionalization of a fluorophore, if half of it, if it's only 50% efficient reaction, then, then, um, then I've lost 50% of my antibody. That was $15,000 I might have just shredded, right? Okay. Number three. Multiple secondary antibodies can bind to each primary, resulting in an amplification of the signal. Okay. So I have one antibody, but because I have that antibody has two FC domains, right? And oftentimes what we'll do is our secondaries are also what we'll call polyclonal. So what polyclonal means is it binds multiple epitopes on the same protein. Monoclonal means it binds one epitope on one protein. Okay. So if I use a polyclonal antibody against IgG, then that, that primary antibody that's sticking on my one protein now turns into five, six secondary antibodies, all with a fluorophore. Now all of a sudden I get an amplification of the signal and I can detect very small quantities of A, my protein, or B, Maybe more effectively, I can use much less of my really expensive primary antibody and get a similar level of detection of that protein. All right, again, so usually you have very little of the primary antibody and ultimately using a secondary antibodies allows us to save on reagents. All right, so how much are we saving? Uh, this actually happens to be from Kevin's lab. Uh, they were making an antibody against this phosphorylated epitope here. Uh, if you want to see, C-R-E-P-S-T-P-P. -P. And this is a, it's actually a pretty fair price. Although I will say they did not get a lot of antibody out of this, right? So if we break this down to make one antibody for which there was no commercially available antibody for this epitope, and they had a very specific need to be able to detect this exact phosphorylation event. So the first thing they have to do is they have to synthesize what they're going to immunize the animal with, right? So they've got to synthesize that protein. 
And they've also got to make a phosphorylated version and a non-phosphorylated version, because ultimately they've got to prove to themselves that the antibody that they're getting, in this case from a rabbit, will bind the phosphorylated version, but not the non-phosphorylated version. Right? Otherwise, the antibody doesn't tell me what I think it's telling me. Okay, so there's some validation. We're going to make, in this case, polyclonal antibody production uh, in two rabbits. So you always do two, just in case one doesn't make any antibodies. It's kind of expensive to go through the whole process and end up with nothing, which has happened to me before. All right. Oh, he even got a promotional startup fee. That's awesome. All right. So there you go. Uh, and then we're going to do phosphopurification, right? So they're going to purify the antibody through affinity purification uh, in order to, uh, to generate a more concentrated, concentrated product. Okay. All right. So the total, around five grand. Most of it, about half of it, a little less, a little less than half of it is uh, peptide synthesis. The antibody production is ironically the cheapest part, right? Rabbits are not terribly expensive. Me injecting them is not very expensive, right? But what is expensive is now taking their blood, their sera, and actually trying to pull out the antibody from all the other proteins that are there. The other thing is that it's not like that antibody, that rabbit isn't making antibodies to other things, right? So a lot of times there's a an upcharge because these animals are in uh, pathogen-free environments. So hopefully their immune system is already fairly quiescent and they're not making antibodies to, I don't know, some disease that they're being faced with, right? Um, still, they're making antibodies to stuff. And you've got to purify your antibody of interest from, from that of, of the others. So what does it look like? I'm doing okay on time. Um, this is sort of a general general schedule um, for for making uh, for making antibodies in animals. Um, in this case, uh, it's a 77 day procedure. Uh, so the first thing they're going to do is uh, they're going to bleed the animal just a little bit, and they're trying to figure out do they already have a ton of antibody titer, right? If this animal, for some unknown reason, is jacked up in its antibody production. For me, as an experimentalist, that represents contaminating antibodies. Now, all of a sudden, I'm detecting antibodies, or I'm detecting proteins that aren't the protein that I'm interested in detecting, right? So I'm going to do uh, a, a small serum draw, and we're going to titer the antibodies. Hopefully, they have very low. And then we're going to generate uh, an initial response. So we do a, a prime, what's called the primary subcutaneous injection. We're going to use about 500 micrograms or 0.5 mg of your protein of interest, right? That has been purified, so I know it's the only thing I'm delivering. So it could be the peptide that Dr. James produced. We'll make recombinant proteins in the lab that we want to make antibodies against. So we'll make sure that they're, they're uh, purified. And then we're going to add this FCA, or what's known as Freud's complete adjuvant. Um, it's pretty remarkable that we still use this crap um, uh, to, uh, to generate an immune response. In fact, uh, I think we're just now out of using uh, FCA in human vaccines, right? And this is essentially a way, it's a really harsh way to just kind of hit the immune system in the head and say, hey, there's something here. You need to pay attention, start making antibodies. So what Freud's complete, uh, complete adjuvant is, uh, is a mixture of mineral oil, surfactant, and dead mycobacteria. Sounds pretty disgusting, it is. Um, so the mineral oil, uh, its primary purpose is to increase the viscosity of the mixture. So I'm gonna inject this subcutaneously, so not into the muscle, just between, uh, just into the dermis uh, of a rabbit or a, a mouse or Make them in llamas now. You make llama antibodies. Um, I have this dream of making alpaca antibodies. They're super cool. Uh, just because I want an alpaca farm, that's all. Um, so uh, you inject these subcutaneously. Uh, what the mineral oil is going to do is increase the viscosity. So it doesn't just immediately start diffusing away. So it's just like any other biochemical reaction. I need a concentration, right? I need a concentration to get over the energy threshold 
for my immune system to start making antibodies. So if it's a very diffuse signal, then we've got normal mechanisms that say, uh, we should be careful about making too many antibodies because we might make antibodies against our own self-antigens, right? And so uh, there are a lot of checks and balances. So mineral oil kind of helps keep it together. Surfactant is going to reduce the surface tension so that although it stays together, it kind of penetrates into the tissue a bit, okay? So that's what those two things do. Where the money end is is on this dead mycobacteria. And so we're going to kill the, the bacteria, these mycobacteria, because obviously we don't want to actually infect the animal, right? But what we do want to do is to present the animal with what we call danger signals, or PAMPs, okay? So these danger signals are a way to get the immune system to wake up and say, hey, there's a bacterial invasion here, even though it's already dead, right? We've attenuated it. So you'll hear about making antibodies against attenuated viruses, right? When you're thinking about our flu vaccines and things like that, a lot of times what they're doing is injecting you with attenuated virus. It means they can't replicate, they're dead viruses, but they'll do that with Freud's adjuvant or other better, more modern adjuvants in order to kickstart your immune system to make antibodies against that virus, okay? It's the same, same principle. Uh, so we're going to do that. Then around day 21, we'll give them about three weeks to start generating a response. And we have to prime. We have to boost. And that's normal for every, even for us, right? The first exposure to uh, an antigen, you actually don't generate a terribly robust antibody response. You generate B cells and plasma cells, right, that are kind of hunkered down and ready. It's when you boost them and they're re-exposed to that same antigen, now they'll produce a robust um, antibody expression response. So what we're going to do is we're going to give them another 500 micrograms of our, remember, what's important in this is, is our, um, uh, this is that the antigen of interest, not the, the mycobacteria, right? That just is what gets things kicked up. And so in this case, we're going to um, inject that 500 micrograms with what we call uh, Freud's, uh, Freud's uh, incomplete adjuvant. And the difference is that we're not interested in giving it mycobacteria anymore. Okay? So the body should recognize the protein, the peptide, whatever the antigen is that you've delivered it, it should now recognize that as form, right? Because we prime the system to do that. Okay? We're going to give it another boost, another 21 days later. And then about 10 days later, we're going to do uh, our first production bleed. I know it sounds awful. Um, we're going to average about 200 mils of uh, syrup from the rabbit. And our main goal there is A, to make the antibody that we want. Is it reactive to the proteins that we're interested in? right? And is it not reactive to proteins that we're not interested in? Okay. So we're going to do an ELISA titer assay as well. What a titer assay is, it's asking a simple question, how much IgG, how much antibody is in that blood? So we want lots of IgG that the animal is primed to make this antibody and that it is making it. How much is it making it and is it specific? All right. Day 63, we're going to give it another boost and then we're going to do one more production bleed 10 days later. Okay? All right. We'll do, uh, again, an ELISA, just to make sure that, A, they're still making it. We'll continue to check the specificity as much as we can. Uh, and somewhere around day 77, in this case, we'll terminate the animal. Okay? And we'll extract all the rest of its plasma, right, its blood, we'll spin down the red blood cells, get rid of those, and then that's our antibody stock. Okay? All right, so 77 days to determine, right, and a heck of a lot of effort, right? There's still no guarantee that you've made an antibody against what you want to make an antibody against and that it's going to be as specific as you want, right? There's some really cool technology now. My buddy in Switzerland is one of them that's developing where we actually do deep sequencing of B cells after, like, an initial injection with Freud's adjuvant. You pull all the B cells, it is a terminal thing, so we're going to pull all the marrow cells, sequence every single one of their uh, B cells, 
and he uses machine learning to actually figure out like what is the repertoire of antibodies that this animal is starting to make. Uh, he's actually um, now probably pissed off a few pharmaceutical companies that he's gotten around their patent on, I think, three of the four most highest grossing drugs in the world. It's kind of crazy. Um, but it's a big it's a big gamble. It's a lot of money. I just said we just spent five thousand dollars and we put in a lot of work, and that's so you can run a Western quad. <laughs> okay. All right, so that brings us to an ELISA. All right. So hopefully what I've done is I've impacted this concept that generating a primary antibody is expensive, risky business. Okay? And there are no guarantees. Like I said, we paid a company it's close to $30,000 to generate what's known as a single chain antibody. It's a variant of, it's just the fab fragment. Uh, and they produced nothing. And they're like, thank you, we'll cash your check now. Right? Their report was, it cannot be made. There you go. All right. So ELISA stands for Enzyme Linked Immunosorbent Assay. So these uh, E L I S A ELISA, and essentially it's a Western blot in a dish, but not quite. Okay, so we'll go through some of the the differences. All right, so there are two different forms that I'm going to talk about. One is uh, a direct ELISA, right, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. And the second is what we call a sandwich ELISA, and some there's some um, strengths and weaknesses to each. All right. So the original form of ELISA was a direct ELISA. Here's our antigen of interest, right? And it can be from a complex mixture, right? So this could be a plasma protein from uh, in an animal, but I don't have to purify that protein. I can just, if I'm trying to ask how much, so this is a great way to, to measure antibody type, right? So I pulled that plasma from the animal and I'm trying to ask how much IgG is present I don't have to separate it into its, its uh, constitutive components. I just put the plasma and titrate it down, right? Make serial dilutions, right, of that plasma so I get various amounts of the plasma that's coating this surface. ELISA plates work through electrostatic interactions. So it's a charged surface. I'm going to jack up the pH to like 9.5-ish in order to make sure that my proteins are charged and I get a nice charge-charge interaction. And that's how we get the proteins to stick to the surface. Okay? All right, so they're very, very sticky, similar to the PVDF. We're going to block it, right? Because they're so um, apt to bind protein, we've got to block up all the nonspecific sites. We're going to use heat denatured BSA or casein or any number of these nonspecific proteins, right? Proteins that don't have affinity for, in general, don't have affinity for other proteins, importantly, don't have affinity for antibodies. All right, that would be bad. We're going to add our primary antibody, just like we did, right? We're going to wash, wash, wash. And then we're going to add some type of enzyme-linked secondary antibody. So this provides us an opportunity, then, to make some type of colorimetric assay. Uh, what we use in the case of ELISA is some type of chromogenic substrate. So it's, an, so it's a, a substrate that, let's say, will go from, uh, will undergo a reaction uh, mediated by this enzyme, right? Horseradish peroxidase, again, is a good one that we use a lot. And it'll, sh it'll shift the color from yellow to blue, right? And so you can actually measure the amount of yellow to the amount of blue, right? Mostly the, the amount of blue that starts to evolve. But because it's an enzyme, right, there's a temporal component to it. So what it means is I can use insanely tiny amounts of primary antibody, right, uh, in order to detect very, very small signatures. Because I've got an enzyme, it's sitting there generating blue, 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 blue. And in fact, if I let it go for too long, everything turns blue, right? Because given enough time, even the little bits of nonspecific, let's say I have uh, only a block plate with no specific antigen, there's still going to be some level of non-specific antibody interactions. You will, there's no 100% in these things, right? So if I get any non-specific uh, antibody, right, 
and an amplification with that secondary antibody means I have horseradish peroxidase in there. And as we know, an enzyme is just going to keep doing its thing, right? So it's going to keep generating, in this case, a blue color uh, until they're, they're all saturated, okay? So it's something that you, you have to be aware of. And so instead of now imaging on an imager, we're going to put this in a plate reader and we're going to measure the absorbance, right? The, the specific absorbance of that chromogenic substrate. All right. Um, so before I go to sandwich of lines, I want to ask a couple questions. So the first is, I mentioned that the plates are charged, right? That we're going to use charge-charge interactions. What, are, what is another way that you could think about binding our, a protein mixture to a surface? What are some of the other interactions that we've talked about that can do that? Hydrophobic interactions, right? So you're talking about SDS being able to intercalate in and bind up those hydrophobic interactions. Is there a reason that we would, because hydrophobic interactions are probably some of the strongest. So is there a compelling reason why I would not want to use hydrophobic interactions as the main mechanism of protein adsorption and binding onto a surface? It is a sticky day. Well, so is the charge. I mean, in general, the charge-charge interactions, especially when I jack up pH, uh, it's going to generate a charge on those pro on proteins, and so they're going to both. They're also going to non-specifically bind. So that is correct. Hydrophobic will do the same. Is there another reason that a hydrophobic surface might be a bad choice? What does SDS do? It denatures the protein, right? So a hydrophobic surface is going to do the, effectively the same thing as SDS, right? A hydrophobic surface works by stabilizing the protein's own hydrophobic domains, right? And what that's going to lead to is the protein beginning to unfold in order to maximize those interactions, right? All right. So we can destroy epitopes, essentially, uh, if we use hydrophobic interactions. So you mentioned that charge is, or you had mentioned non-specificity of hydrophobic interactions. I just mentioned that charge interactions are also non-specific. So what are some potential pitfalls with having non-specific interactions as the mechanism of basically presenting your protein to your primary antibody? What is the definition of nonspecific, right? Is that I can't decide whether if my protein has a certain structure, whether it's going to sit like this, whether it's going to sit like this, right? So I have no, if I have no specific way to orient that protein the way I need it to, it could be that it favors, let's say the epitope is here, but the protein favors a downward position due to its ionic map, right? It's ionic charge on its surface. If that's the case, then I don't care if I've raised an antibody against this domain, I can add copious amounts of antibody and I won't detect that protein because the, the site for antibody binding has now been shielded. Okay? All right. So that really leads us then to this idea of a sandwich elisa. So this is one of the issues that early investigators had was that you couldn't predict your signal to a certain degree because it was a little bit stochastic about how the protein would wind up binding to the surface. Uh, and so there was obviously large percentages of the protein of interest that could not be detected. And so in order to try to, the, the, the goal of a lot of these assays is to try to push the boundaries of our detection capability. I want to be able to detect the most minuscule amount of protein. Think about um, uh, serum biomarkers, right, for cancer, right? If, if it requires you to have milligram quantities of the biomarker in your bloodstream, right, then that's indicative of a stage four cancer, right? If I can detect fiftogram quantities of that same biomarker, right, it suggests that I can detect the cancer at a much earlier stage, right? 
that this is sort of the drive behind trying to push technology towards higher and higher levels of, of detection of smaller and smaller. Okay. So in the case of a sandwich ELISA, what we're going to do is same charged plates. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to use what we call a capture antibody. Okay. So the capture antibody is a way to begin to concentrate our protein of interest. If I've coded with a capture antibody that's specific for protein A, then presumably all the other proteins can effectively be washed away, right? And I'm concentrating it from solution uh, onto the surface. So again, we're going to block. We don't want random crap sticking to the plate. And now I'm going to add my antigen. But again, remember, if this is serum, right, then my antigen is in a mixture of other proteins. So in this case, I can add it, and over time, you'll get a concentration of your antigen of interest on those capture antibodies. And now I can wash away all the other stuff. Okay, so I'm, this is like a surface concentration effect. I'm going to wash, and then I'm going to add a detection antibody. All right? Now, what's critical about the detection antibody versus the capture antibody? They're both, what are, what are both these examples of? Primary antibodies. They're both primary antibodies. They're both binding our antigen of interest. What's critical about the different... Uh, what's a critical component of a capture antibody and a detection antibody? Where would this fail? And we'll ask it that way. Yeah, so if the primary, if I'm, I'm basically effectively using two primaries in the same assay system, where does that where are the pitfalls in that approach? Yes, that, that's absolutely true, right? So you don't, I definitely do not want to detect the green antibody with my secondary because that's a false signal, right? It's a false positive. The other issue, just for the sake of time, is that if I have two monoclonal antibodies, they certainly cannot bind the same epitope, right? Because I would use that, it, the epitope that I'm using to capture my antigen cannot be the epitope that I'm using for my detection antibody, okay? One way to get around that is a lot of times what we'll do is we'll capture with a monoclonal and then our detection antibody will be a polyclonal, right? We're detecting one epitope, but we're, we're, excuse me, we're capturing with one epitope, but we're detecting with an antibody that can bind multiple epitopes on the target of interest. And then again, we're going to use uh, an enzyme-linked secondary antibody. And what's the benefit of this? What were the benefits we talked about? Yeah? We don't lose our yeah, we're not using up our primary antibody. Even from the figure, what am I getting out of my secondary antibody here? Anybody? What is secondary antibody doing to our signal? <coughs> Amplifying, right? We're getting an amplification, right? Okay. Cheap, amplify it. At our chromogenic substrate, the same is the same. Uh, the same is the same, good grief. The process is the same. Uh, and then we're going to measure absorbance, okay? All right. All right. So I've just told you now, in this case, the, the, the ELISA, which seems easier to you, an ELISA or Western blot? An ELISA? Yeah, right. I don't have to resolve the proteins in a gel, transfer them. Sometimes the transfers, yeah? You should. Yeah. I, in an ELISA, same as a Western blot, every single time you add something new to the system, 
and then you're about to change it to another, right? Like primary to secondary, secondary to chromogenic substrate. You wash the you know what out of that. And you might, depending on, depending on the specifics of the antibody, what you wash with, right? We're being very generic here, wash. What the heck does that mean, right? Like wash A with how much, with what, for how long, right? These are oftentimes to, de to be determined somewhat experimentally. They're rules of thumb. When I wash, I usually always want some type of aqueous solvent, right, like PBS, phosphate buffered saline. It's pH 7.4, it's physiological pH, right? It's got the right osmotic value for, pro right, we're trying not to disturb the proteins too much. If I've got a sticky antibody, I might wash with what I call PBST, which is phosphate buffered saline with tween 20, which is a surfactant. Helps me resolve some of these hydrophobic, non-specific hydrophobic interactions. If I've got an antibody that likes to stick ionic things for whatever reason, then I might jack up the salt concentration to help salt off uh, any non-specific interactions. So you play with the buffers that you wash with in order to try to maximize your, your specific signal and minimize your background signal. You always have background. There's always background, right? And you're trying to find that window where the delta, the difference between my signal and my background, is the largest, right? Okay. Good question. Yeah, so an ELISA is a heck of a lot easier, right? From a temporal perspective, right? I'm adding things to a dish. I can actually get a robot, and we have a robot in the lab that does ELISA for us. Just chit, 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 chit. We program it in. This is the antibody I want. Take from that well, put it in that one. Right, then wash X amount of time with X amount of buffer for X amount of time, right? And then add the secondary, right? It can do, we can automate this. So it's really super nice. You cannot automate gels as well. There are parts you can automate, but not all of it. So it makes the ELISA, the ELISA is also much more sensitive, right? Um, I can actually detect far less antibodies, specifically with a sandwich ELISA. With a sandwich ELISA, because I'm concentrating all the protein of interest from a large volume, right? I just keep adding more volume, and eventually I will get like amplification of that primary signal at the plate surface, right? So I can detect very, very uh, minuscule amounts. So the question is, why not ELISAs all the time? This is an example, uh, actually, of, of an experimental data set that was brought here to UVA. Um, in this case, uh, this group, uh, this is uh, University of British Columbia uh, in Canada, was interested in measuring phospho erc one 2 ELISA um, in, in response to uh, this infectious agent, right? So how much does, in this, this microbe, cause uh, phosphorylation of ERK1 and 2? Uh, as a, an upstream signal in um, infection defense, okay? So they generated this data set, and of course, the observations are pretty clear. You get a spike, right? You get a spike in uh, the, the um, uh, time in um, uh, post-infection, so here's zero time point. I hit the cells, and I get a really early 0.17 hours, I get a spike, and then it begins to drop. Same here, spike, drop, spike, drop. So I get a dose dependency and time dependency signal, right? So they brought this data set here, uh, and Kevin's lab does a lot of ERK signaling. He says, well, you know, the antibody against ERK1 and 2, it in specific, right? So one of the problems with ELISA is that we talked about the fact that you make a fundamental assumption that your antibody is specific for the target that you want and nothing else. In this case, the homology between ERK5 and ERK1 and 2 is so close, it's impossible to generate an antibody that can distinguish the two isoforms from the other one. Okay? They're just too similar. So you can see here, if I run this, uh, this as a Western blot, what the Western blot gives me is the power of separation. And here I say, this antibody that was used for this ELISA, this signal is comprised of 
an ERC-5 signal and an ERC-1 and 2 signal, right? So this isn't 100% phospho ERC-1-2. Um, we're running out of time, so I won't go through this thought experiment with you guys, but what they did to resolve this, right, was they're going to, the, what they're infecting with is this uh, Coxsackie virus B3. Talked about Coxsackie virus a while ago. Uh, and in this case, they're looking for phospho ERK1 to ELISA signal. Now, this isn't exactly correct, right? This is this signal here, which we've now said also has an ERK5 signal in there as well. So what they did was they have a sham, so they don't add anything to these cells. They're going to add that virus to these cells and measure ERK. They're going to add that virus, measure ERK, but they're going to put it in the presence of an ERK-1-2 inhibitor, right? So for all intents and purposes, you can think about ERK-1 and 2 being negated, right? Now, caveat. If I assume that my antibodies are specific, right, what do we do in pharmacological experiments? So this is a pharmacological inhibitor for ERK-1-2. I'm making a fundamental assumption here as well. What is that? That it's specific. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that there's no such thing as 100% specificity in biology. In this particular case, it's pretty specific, so we'll go with it. But I guarantee you it has off-target effects. At the wrong concentration, you can probably start inhibiting other things. But what they did was they resolved this discrepancy uh, by doing the exact same experiment in the presence of various inhibitors uh, that inhibit either ERK uh, 1 and 2 or 1, 2, and 5. And what you find is that the majority of the signal, so if I inhibit 1 and 2, you could make a simple subtraction and say that this part here is the bit of that initial signal that's associated with ERK 1 and 2, because when I inhibit ERK 1 and 2, right, the signal decreases. Does that make sense by that amount? If I inhibit all three, then I come back almost to sham. So I would make an interpretation that the rest of this signal here, right there, is responsible, uh, is uh, um, caused by the ERK-5, ERK okay? So it's a way that you now have to begin to combine different methodologies, antibodies with pharmacological inhibitors. A lot of times then we'll get to a point where we'll discuss gene knockdown, all right, in order to basically turn these knobs to make um, interpretations of, of data. Okay. All right. So, almost done. So like Westerns, like the antibody sandwich, and like affinity chromatography that we've talked about, lateral flow immunochromatography uh, is going to utilize these same, these same mechanisms. So we're getting back to our pregnancy test. So what is lateral flow immunochromatography? It's essentially an on-chip. You can think about it as one of the earliest microfluidics, right? Um, it's an on-chip detection. Uh, we have our little chamber here that has some type of resin. You can think about that resin as being similar to a polyacrylamide gel or uh, a membrane that allows that molecule. Um, in this case, because it's a dry device and we put a liquid right on it, we're going to actually use a form of capillary action right, in order to draw that protein. You guys remember organic chemistry and you get, you guys have taken organic chemistry, have you guys ever done like organic separations? Holy cow, uh, yeah, all right, anyway. You dip your, <laughs> you have this weird paper membrane, right? And you dip it in a fluid and it'll wick up that material, that's essentially what's going on here. So it's like having a dry piece of tissue paper and putting it onto a droplet right vertically, and you'll see that liquid wick up uh, the tissue paper. So it's the same thing. So here's our antigen here in the red. We're going to drop it on here, and we're going to use capillary action to wick that material uh, from left to right. <coughs> Here on the left, we've sort of non-covalently coupled this antibody gold particle mixture, right? So this antibody right here in purple, 
It's going to bind our analyte or our, um, our antigen. And these antibodies are coupled to gold, uh, little gold nanoparticles. And all that allows us to do is to actually see them. When they get concentrated, they become, they become optically dense and they appear as a dark band, right, or a dark spot. Okay? So we're going to drop that on. Antibody is going to bind. It's going to wick through that material. And we're going to get two signals if we're positive. If we're positive, we've effectively made a sandwich ELISA, right? We've done it a little bit in reverse where we bound our detection antibody onto the antigen and then found the capture antibody, right? But the principle is the same. Uh, in the case of the control, we've simply spotted against or non-covalently bound the, the antigen of interest to tell us that, what does this tell us if we see a band come out in the control or C? It's called control. What's that? It's a functional test. What does the positive band tell us? It's not, I'm not trying to be tricky here. It tells you the assay works, right? Like, if this thing has been exposed to, what are the kinds of things that could wreck this kind of test? Given the components of the test, think to yourself, what are the different things that could wreck this test and give you something that is non, can't detect what you want it to detect? Yeah? Is this an explosion when it's too hot? Yeah, All right? I've got an antibody in there, and presumably, right, in the case of the pregnancy test, this is a gonadotrophin protein, right? So I've got a protein in there. If I enroll full of that, I have no idea if the antibody is still going to recognize the epitope that I raised the antibody against. So we've got still biomolecules in here. So increased temperature, increased pH, right? Changes in pH can adjust this. Uh, so all of these kinds of things. Given enough time, presumably, eventually, because we've non-covalently bound, this is an ELISA-type test, right? Eventually, these things will come off, right? And this line becomes a little less <laughs> rigid and starts diffusing, and eventually you won't, be able to, you won't be able to see the control. So the control is really telling us that A, the test works, and then the sample uh, here is telling us that, that you get a positive signal. All right. Okay. All right. So uh, there we are at the end of at least a few biochemical methods. Um, I don't know. This is the fun part. This is, uh, this is where you actually detect stuff. Um, but you will be, um, you'll obviously be doing this a lot next year in Ideas Lab. Um, and so uh, happy to ask questions. Again, the quiz on Thursday will be... Um, all, only the, the protein biochemistry component, so the pre-lecture and lecture uh, for, this, for this particular section, okay? All right. And then we'll start talking about immunology next. Yes. They're on my counter, and I'll be there.